Welcome to Huddle Up with Matias Bueno. Today, I'm very excited to bring on a legendary CFL quarterback, TSN panel member, Matt Dunnigan. Matt, thanks for joining me today. I'm really excited to talk about the 91 Argos with you. Some 30 years ago, one of the greatest CFL Grey Cup teams came onto the, onto the scene and changed the league for a long time. Did you say one of? The. I think, I think, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, I, I, I think it is. Um, it was a euphoric season, Mateusz, and uh, it was just, uh, I think that's why people are so intrigued with that championship football team from the ownership on down to how it materialized and unfolded. Uh, it was just uh, one heck of a magic carpet ride. Everything that surrounded the 91 Argos really just created amazing entertainment. The television ratings were off the charts. It was a time that was unlike any other that we've seen in the CFL. From the very first day that the ownership group was announced all the way to winning the Great Cup in Winnipeg. So let's start at the beginning. The ownership group was announced what went through your mind when you heard the names of the three gentlemen who purchased the Toronto Argos? Yeah, yeah, that I think everybody was in disbelief. Um, I think more than anything, and uh, but we were excited as well uh, because of you know the, the team was needing uh, a, a shot in the arm, so to speak, and it got that and then some. And when Hollywood came to Toronto, so. I can tell you that uh, the disbelief turned into uh, expectations and everybody was, you know, a little overwhelmed by the names involved from Bruce McNall to John Candy to Wayne Gretzky. It's like those are household names. If you're a hockey fan, certainly if you were uh, uh, a movie goer, um, personality doesn't get any bigger than John Candy. And so, Everybody was just intrigued by the possibilities. And what are these guys all about? And we quickly found out that they put their money where their mouth is and, um, and they supported us and they loved us and embraced the game. And it just wasn't a marketing ploy. It was uh, a true love affair between the ownership group, the city and, uh, and, the, and the football team itself. And each individual player was embraced and, uh, and treated like, like a son. And um, and everybody in the front offices felt the same way from top down. Um, it became a family and uh, it was it was uh, so those that disbelief turned into reality and the reality that we were living in was uh, euphoric. It was uh, it was over the top because we'd never seen anything like it. I've been in the league since 83. We're now talking 91. So I believe I'm going in my ninth year. and. Uh, Eight, eight years of starter and uh yeah we we're like what's going on you know i've never seen anything like this before you know, typically you're going to your equipment manager i'll use an example of Dwayne mandrusiak long time equipment manager for the edmonton football team and we used to beg beg Dwayne for a new pair of socks you know and uh you know and, because you just, and one, it's cold, and two, there's holes all in them. You just, you know, you're looking for a new pair of socks. You know, it's, come on, how hard can this be? It's professional football. Well, you'd be surprised. And then, uh, and then, you know, you fast forward to 91, and anything and everything that you wanted was looked after. You know, uh, somebody asked for, uh, I think, an espresso machine or a cappuccino machine in the locker room. Bang, it's there. You know, I was like, what, what is that? You know, it's like you clap and, and and it and it appears, you know, you wiggle your nose like Bewitched and Sam Stevens, and you know it appears it's probably way over your head, but and way before your time. Uh, how about wiggle your nose? I dream a genie, or you know, thank you know, and every wish that you uh, wished for uh, basically turned true that that year because um, money was not an object for this for these ownership group, and they wanted to make sure that we had everything we at our fingertips to uh, to be successful. And, it was uh, foreign, to say the least. Um, and you know, oftentimes you're pinching yourself because uh, of the attitude change, the environment, and uh, you had everything all of a sudden at your fingertips to go out there and be successful. And in and around that time, too, you look at how the CFL started to change. You mentioned like begging for a pair of socks to yeah. getting flown home on a private jet with John Candy from 
Sask- Regina, Saskatchewan, and all the different sorts of perks and accolades that came with having such a fantastic ownership group. What was it like the first time, first few times that you were around John Candy? Because he was larger than life, literally and figuratively. Yeah, well, but he was as real as the day is long. Um, he was uh, he was just another guy and uh, a guy that absolutely loved uh, being a part of the Argonaut football team, a team that he cherished and grew up admiring and, and cheering for. And and, uh, and and so once you got over the fact that you know, it's, it's John Candy, you know, it's like, what the heck? You know, what are we doing having cocktails? Um, once you got over that, you know, it was hanging out with another guy. And, um, and it was a spectacular ride. He was what you see on television, what you anticipate. Oftentimes people are acting. John Candy was not acting. He was, he was as, as pure a human as you can get. And, uh, and he showed us that each and every time he interacted with everybody and he interacted with everybody front office all the way down. And, uh, it didn't matter. John was the same person and loving and caring and uh, would do anything for anybody. And he oftentimes did. Uh, I can remember the first time I met Rocket and, um, and, uh, and, and John and Wayne and Bruce, it was, uh, we had to land Rocket first, right? We had to go get him. You know, we had to entice him. And uh, yeah, I was tapped on the shoulders quarterback to go down there and try to make that happen with a group of people in the entourage that Bruce had with them and flew from I remember meeting Raga in the front it was the Sky Dome Hotel back then right and uh, we're sitting there and uh, I'm wearing some ostrich skin boots uh, some tight jeans got cowboy belt on you know sporting uh, mullet and Ragab is in a t-shirt just hanging out, sitting on the corner of the chair next to him, and he's admiring my boots and got a good picture of that. And uh, and from that point forward, we spent the next, like, 72 hours together, flying to Vegas, get, you know, landing on the runway, getting picked up in a limo, going downtown Vegas, um, walking into places like uh, 3,000 miles of Graceland, you know, just uh, – like kicking the door open, rolling down the middle of these casinos and having a blast with this entourage. And then boom, you know, three, four hours later, we're back on the plane flying to Vegas and, and we get wine to dine there for 48 hours. We got some great stories of Raga Bear and Bruce Nall. And it was just, it was one crazy beginning to a crazy football season. And it never stopped. The train just kept on rolling. And, um, uh, and Ragab was enticed to come up there, and they paid him handsomely, and and it started this uh, this chapter that people continue to talk about. It was just over the top amazing. No, I need to ask. You mentioned some of the articles of clothing you were wearing and your with your attire. Would you say that you had better swag than Brian Bosworth in and around that late '80s, early '90s when it came to professional football? Ooh. Uh the Boz Boz was setting his own deal, you know, with his flat top and his jacked up body and uh you know his swagger. He, he was pretty good. Um uh, I would say that I was right there with the Boz, Jim McMahon. Um he was another guy in that era that um you know danced and marched to his own drummer and beat uh and then some typically, you know. Uh, it was, you know, we're just, we're having fun. I mean, you, and if you're put in an environment, which I'm sure uh, Jim and Boz were, you can be yourself. I mean, uh, but then you took care of business, uh, you know, as, as a member of a team. And <laughs> I think that was what was unique about Toronto and the Argos in 91. And most of the championship teams that you talk about in any sport will have the same common characteristics. A bunch of great individuals that realize how to come together, no matter how many quirks they have or whatnot, they're accepted. They accept the role, they play the role, they do it and they execute and everybody comes together and you accept it um, because you understand your role. So Boz, Jim, myself, whatever, we're just, 
hanging out, having fun, playing a game, trying to make it work. And, um, and, and hopefully you find the right ingredients and mix of people and characters and, uh, to come together to, to, to finish off, um, an incredible, uh, opportunity, you know, that's always at your fingertips at every, at the start of every season. And, uh, this was a little bit different. And so, yeah, I had some swag going on, but you know, that swag, you know, uh, uh, was there from day one and r- arriving in Edmonton in 83 and, you know, pretty much the same clothes, you know, nine years later, nothing's really changed. It's just the swag is still there and accents there and just the way I hold myself, you know, in the locker room and in the huddle, just playing just with confidence because you put in the time, you put in the work and you know that you're prepared and, 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 and you expect victory. And uh, that's, that's, that's all that is. It's, you call it swag. I call it preparation. And uh, and I walked in the <laughs> in that locker room, meeting John, Bruce, Wayne, Raga, same way, same person, and uh, everybody else uh, was the same way. I think they had a vibe about themselves that offered you the opportunity to be yourself as long as you bought in, and did your job. And I think Wayne, Bruce, and and John certainly created that environment where everybody wanted to be a part of it and didn't want to screw it up. You mentioned characters coming together to achieve the ultimate goal, which in the CFL every year is to win the great cup. When you look at how star studded that team was, even just beyond the field with head coach and Adam Rita and all the stars like Daryl K. Smith and Paul Mazzotti, yourself, pinball rocket. There were so many people that came together at the right time and, what did you think of the roster at the time as far as it went outside of the main stars? Because there were so many key pieces on that team. Even someone like Chris Schultz was huge on that offensive line. Well, well, you, you talk about offense. You know, we had defense out there too, best in the league. You know, we had special teams, best in the league. Um, we had guys on those teams that, that played their roles, uh, you know, uh, you forgot it. I mean, he's speaking offensively. You know, you got to talk about uh, Calvin Primster, Bob Skimp, Ian Beckstead, uh, Dan Froney, and Chris Schultz, and Blaine Schmidt, and John Coughlin. Those are your offensive linemen. Those are you guys that make it happen offensively for us, stars, so to speak, and skilled players, so to speak. But those guys set the tone along with our defense. Um, you know, you talk about Rodney Harding. Um, you know, Big Cat was just absolutely amazing. Harold Holm and, you know, linebacking core you know, featured Donnie Moan. And and, and uh, our defensive secondary was just laden with all-stars across the board. Reggie Pleasant, Ed Berry. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Donnie Wilson, Carl Brasley. Uh, we're, just, we're just loaded. And all these guys are superstars. And so the roster um, – and, you know, you missed a guy that my favorite all-time receiver is a Hall of Famer, David Williams. He was in the mix too, right? You can't, can't forget him. In my mind, the best I ever threw to. Um, just just ahead of Brian Kelly. But I can tell you, uh, the guys that you did mention go along with the guys that I speak about. And um, it, was, uh, it was a bunch of all-star guys with huge personalities. And the thing that made it work, was uh, number 25 because he was the focus of everywhere we went. And he had all these superstars, all these stud players that could be the main attraction on any given day, on any given team. And yet we all took back seats. You know, I'm talking about, Chris Gaines, you know, Jethro, the guy that led our our pregame calisthenics, you know, and warm-ups and then shut us down, you know, and got us ready and hyped. I'm talking about personalities that were just over the top that could carry themselves in any other football team, but we didn't have to because we had 25, and 25 was like a shield. Imagine just a big shield. Everywhere we went, it was like Roger was like, he's taken off and media swarms are all over him. There you got the rest of the crew on the field, no pressures, no media uh, pressure of you know expectations. It was just 
relax, have a good time, do your job, and light it up. And uh, that's what we were able to do because Ragan, at such a young age, 21-year-old, uh, you know, getting paid over $4 million a year, it's like, what? You know, it's like he, he was he was a guy that was fielding all those t- tough questions and and uh, and taking the heat off of us, which was doesn't happen very often. You know, everybody wants to know what went wrong or, you know, what's going on here. And uh, We didn't have to answer those questions. Um, of course, a lot of things really didn't go wrong, you know, other than a few injuries, you know, here and there. But you had so many people in that locker room that could step up and fill the void. It was unbelievable. So, Rog was our shield, and they, and they created another unique dynamic of a football team laden with uh, all stars across the board. You mentioned whenever the team had to deal with injuries, that you always had people who could step up in that next man up mentality. And even for yourself, when you went down sure. during a few games, Ricky Foggy yeah. came in as such an underrated yeah. player. No question. Fog Dog, in my mind, was the best backup quarterback, quarterback at that time in the history of the Canadian Football League. And, uh, you know, until Kevin Glenn came around and Kevin played forever and threw for over 50,000 yards, you know, and a lot of times it's a backup position. But Ricky Foggy, man, Fog Dog come in and light it up. He'd throw seven touchdown passes in the blink of an eye, you know, and he did. And, uh, I don't even know if Ricky ever cracked his playbook. You know, he just went out there and just balled. And uh, thank God we had a guy like Adam Reed as our offensive coordinator, head coach, because you know he 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 let us play to our strengths. Adam always had a pencil behind his ear, and he always had a little four by six note card in his back pocket. And, you know, we'd come, we'd say something to him. He said, "Well, hey, let's just draw that up." He's like, hey, "Let's run it." You know, he showed it to everybody and. Next thing you know, it's in the playbook and we're running it. Who best to run a play than the guys that suggested it, you know? And and so Adam knew that. And with Ricky, he, he played to his strengths and let him go play freely. And uh, and Ricky could do that. And, and he could make every play on the field. And he could make everybody miss on the field. And he oftentimes did. And he had to do it a lot because I was banged up. Man. I was, you know, I was playing like I typically play. But, um, you know, I was uh, I played eight games in 1990s in Argonaut because I was just beat to hell. And then in 91, I played another eight. So there's a lot of football there to be played that Ricky had to step up and 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 take care of. And he did. And uh, he did it in a big way and with that entire dynamic that I'm speaking of, of, of just personalities and understanding your role and going out there and making it happen. Uh, Ricky did that better than anybody, and uh, and he's he's such a big part of of that football team. And uh, because I wasn't out there, you know, I was in the locker room, and I was there, you know, peripherally, and and um, a lot of the time, and I still had to stay engaged and make sure everybody was on point. And uh, Ricky go out there and light it up. So a lot of credit goes to Fog Dog for getting it done, and. Uh, you know, I just I often you know, people ask me, yeah, I think Ricky Foggy's the best backup quarterback in the history of the CFL. Could have been a starter, you know, and uh, I just don't know if um, he was given that opportunity uh, enough. Uh, but I can tell you, he was spectacular coming off the bench, and then in the absence of, of myself, and and uh, he was uh, nobody better in my mind. And when you look at some of the games you guys played that were marquee matchups, there were a lot of big ones. The games against Calgary were tough. The games against Winnipeg, those are probably some of the toughest in terms of a, a rivalry minus the one against Hamilton because it's within the province. You guys playing against Winnipeg was such a – it was great must-watch television. And what was those? What were those battles like when you guys would play against the Bombers? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, uh, we're playing some pretty good football, and we're lighting it up. That was our motto, and uh, and we had no problem doing that because we had so many, so many weapons, such a wide open offense, um, and so everybody wanted a piece of us, you know. And you, you knew you're always going to get everybody's best, no matter what it was, what team it was. You know, they were getting jacked up to play us, 
And we knew that, but, you know, it's like, well, poke the bear, you know, let's, let's, let's see, you know, let's, let's crank this up a little bit. Let's make this, let's, let's compete, you know? So we had no problems. Yeah. Uh, showing our swag and, and, uh, and, talking the talk and walking the walk. We had no problem doing it. Um, you know, you just like challenging yourself and your team. It's like, give us your best. You know, we don't want you limping out here. You know, we want you running over here, but you're going to limp back, you know? And uh, so <laughs> we, uh, we, we, but Winnipeg, you mentioned the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. They had their own swag, you know? They had, um, Linebacking core led by James West and Tyrone Jones at the time. May he rest in peace. Uh, they, they had, you know, they were they were a tough tough football team, and it, and it started defensively with them with their three four defense and the linebackers and their ability to change things up on the fly and give you different looks and cause confusion and schemes up front and and uh, we you know they had our number. Um, for the most part, but uh, we uh, go to the East Final. If you want me to speak about that, you know, oh, I sure. can speak. Of, I can speak of the East Final, and uh, our pity was hot. Okay, um, and uh, we were we were a team that the jaw was set, the hay was in the barn, uh, preparation was meticulously handled. And now it was just for us to physically go out there and unleash uh, uh, just a boatload of fury on a football team that we did not like. Um, and they're not coming into our backyard, um, going to piss in our parade. And the locker room prior to that game was deathly silent. Um, you could hear a pin drop. Nobody had to say a word. We went out there and unleashed fury on the bombers that day, and they had no idea what's hitting them. We were playing faster than they were. We were playing more physical than they were. And by the time they looked up, I think it was thirty-three to three at halftime, or something like that. And uh, and the game was over, and we had just put a beat down on our rivals, a team that thought they could, they had the swag like we did. And uh, we put it on them and that felt good, uh, you know, until the last play of the first half. And uh, I got hit and, and broke my collarbone in three places. And uh, I knew that, uh, you know, basically my season was over with. And, you know, but I had, I had no, I was disappointed. No question. I was, I was devastated. Um, in the process of putting a beat down on the Bombers, um, that happened right at the end of that first half. But my mindset was, you know, we're going to the Great Cup, and uh, we got Fog Dog. We got all this around us. It's like this is this is what this is what a team's all about. And Ricky done it a lot that year already, and he's going to do it again at the Great Cup. And you know, the rest is history. And you guys almost were like the the fun bunch of the Washington team back in the late eighties, every time I practice watching the glory days documentary, you guys were always doing something fun or silly goofing around, dancing, doing some flips. That's Did you ever get involved in doing any of those? Oh yeah. Everybody's got to get involved. You're called out one time or another, you know, and, and oftentimes several times. Yeah. Everybody was involved, you know, do the jet throw, the jet throw. Uh, uh, Chris Gaines, um, a linebacker extraordinaire. The middle linebacker, uh, Gainsey was the heart and soul of that defense in a lot of ways. Um, and he would, he, he'd throw out the new Jack and it was a dance we all did, and including the coaches. And it would just, he always had a little poem for us, typically at the end of just about every practice. And, uh, and he'd just blow it out there and we all do the Jeff throw and, it was just one of those routines and rituals that we got into that, uh, yeah, that defined us. And um, at, we had a good time being with each other. And just didn't matter who, right? You know, but everybody's called out. Always, and nobody, nobody, I, I, I go back to Edmonton my first year, 
and they just won five great cups in a row. And I got to learn from that football team and all those players and what it took to be a team, what it took to, uh, um, to be successful week in, week out, year after year, expectations, uh, role play, and, uh, just having a good time both on and off the football field. And, uh, what it took to be a professional. Okay. So I, I, I was able to learn, you know, from your Waddell Smiths, your Neil Longstons, your Dave Cutlers, your Joe Hollimans, your Eddie Joneses, your Dave Finnells, your Brian Kelly's, Tommy Scott's, Brian Fryers. I'm talking about, you can put a team, they probably roll out there right now and beat people. You know, that's how good they were. But away from the field, it was the, the team unity and closeness it was just incredible. I'm going, this is why they win because they love each other. They're willing, they go out there and they have fun together and then they go out there and they willing to die for each other. And, uh, and that's what the Argonauts had in 91. And, uh, and that's what I made sure no matter what team I was playing on, I took that same mentality and made sure that we had all those ingredients and that mindset both on and off the football field to have success. I think that's why I took you know, four different teams to the cup. And, uh, and I, and I felt pretty comfortable about the Toronto Argonauts. Um, uh, as, as, as we had all, we had that in spades. We had that in, in, in just volumes of personalities. And <laughs> the hardest thing for us to do was control them a little bit. But again, I go back to the shield and Raga Bishmil, he, Raga, he, he took all the heat. We just had fun, you know, and, and uh, just make sure we we're checking off all the boxes throughout the week that we we're going to get it done. And uh, and we did. And so that swagger, you know, Jethro leading us, you know, and anybody else stepping up at the time, you know, like the, like the Edmonton team uh, back in 83, you know, watching them hoot and holler, you know, and road trips. It was just, it was the same type of feeling. And I knew we had some magic there. And, and it unfolded the way it did because it was just unstoppable. One great cup in particular, I did want to touch on briefly that also lives in the lore. You talk about Edmonton and Toronto in 1987, just everything that's surrounding that game as well. When speaking with Paul Woods, who had wrote the book about the year of the rocket, he was mentioning how that was one of the greatest great cups. What memories do you have from that game? Well, um, it was, it was, um, we got in a, we were trying to get back to prowess as an Edmonton football team. 83, we snuck into the back door of the playoffs, got beaten in the first round, you know, and that was the end of the dynasty. Pete Catella was brought in that year to dismantle that team. And Hugh Campbell left to go south for the USFL. And uh, Pete did, really didn't dismantle the team. There was only two faces on that roster that year. Blake Dermont, center from University of Alberta, offensive lineman, went on to play like 16 years. Myself, uh, you know, quarterback from Louisiana Tech, Texas kid. That's the only two changes we had from 82, team that just won its fifth in a row, to 83. And, those lot, and then Warren left after 83. I charted 501 of his passes. You know, I was a cheerleader on the sidelines that year you know, trying to absorb the game. But what I did realize was, like I mentioned before, what it took to lead a football team and what it took to be a successful football team, how to handle yourselves away from the game and and uh, and and during the game and throughout the week of practice and preparation, how the guys approached everything. Took that with me. Uh, in 84, I was handing the football. Jackie Parker became our head coach. He let me make mistakes, learn the game. And uh, we worked our tails off. 84 got beat in the playoffs, I believe, by Winnipeg. 85, we got beat in the playoffs, I believe, by Winnipeg. 86, we started, we started, you know, we were coming into form. And we were, uh, we were tinkering with our roster and getting bigger in the backfield, some more, more physical and, we were changing the face and the dynamic of our football team. In 86, we went to, we go to the cup and we got over the hurdle and we, and uh, I think we beat Winnipeg and then we go to the cup and we faced the Hamilton Tiger Cats in 86 
We've got a decimated offensive line due to a number of different reasons. But 86, we faced the Ticats, who had lost in 84 and 85. So you got a veteran laden team in Hamilton coming to 86 to meet us in the Grey Cup. NBC, and uh, and we get our tails handed to us. And uh, I get sacked like 11 times that game. And we get destroyed. All right. Big lesson learned, right? We weren't as good as, you know, we thought we were. And we didn't, we weren't as focused as we should have been. And we got to figure this out. In 87, we were able to do that. And uh, we went back there with a different mindset, much like the Ticats the year before, tired of losing. They figured it out. They came with a different mindset. In 87, we came with a different mindset. And uh, uh, we, we, we were still stinging from the year before. And uh, we were all out there. Long story short, I get knocked out in the second quarter. Um, and I'm concussed. And I'm not playing another down that year. And Damon takes over. And the team takes over. And everybody starts coming together, and you've got Gizmo returning kickoffs, this field goals, touchdowns, and you've got Damon Allen balling. He was the MVP of the game because, you know, he was kind of like, he said, hello, CFL, hello, Canada, this is me. And uh, and the next, well, he'd already played two years in 85 and 86, and uh, so this is his third year, and he basically said hello to Canada that day. Won MVP, came back, brought our team back, and you know Jerry Carr kicks a long field goal uh, to win it for us. Uh, and from that point forward, Danny played from that point twenty more years. Can you believe that? Twenty more freaking years, and uh, just doing his thing and. My hat's off to him for getting the job done there because I was on the sideline, head was spinning, and really, uh, uh, you know, was on the outside looking in. But it was one of those football teams that had been piecemealed together for four years, uh, and and eighty four, five, six, and seven, and uh, we got her done as a team, and that's just that's that's the epitome of of champions is is leaning on every aspect of of every member of that football team. And that's what happened that day. We got it done. And uh, it was just a hell of a ride uh, to uh, – and a way to finish off a, a rebuilding, re, remolding, you know, revamping process there in Edmonton. We got it done. It was felt good to get that accomplished. And then when you look on the flip side of things, because as CFL fans know that quarterback carousel is – at crazier than it is in the NFL team guys switch teams like crazy and back, back then sure yeah and especially the 80 so you look at the 87 Argos lose a close one to you guys in the great cup and then they are trying to get back and then they get back again in 1991 and you look it's with the opportunity in Winnipeg for you guys to win it all and what was the buzz surrounding the team that week because it was almost like the expectation you guys were supposed to be there but you were dealing with the injury and there was questions as to if you were going to play in the game, but you found a way. So talk about the 91 great cup against the Calgary Stampeders. Well, um, there wasn't really a whole lot of thought process about playing um, because my collarbone was broken in three places on my throwing arm. And uh, it's like who in the right mind even thinks about, trying to make that happen and well i can tell you adam rita um, matt dunnigan uh our entire um staff uh we had a meeting and said well first of all we got to figure out whether or not you can throw that'd be probably critical throughout the game as it turned out it really wasn't but um it was one of those things we had to figure out whether or not I could at least go through the motions. And uh, so they shot me up with some Zytokane, Marcane, and some adrenaline that night in the hotel ballroom in Winnipeg. And uh, I had my dad, my training staff, Adam, uh, 
uh, doctors, uh, and uh, everybody was in attendance to make sure that we went through the steps to see if we could do it. And uh, wasn't it wasn't a good start. The skipping balls, you know, three, four yards away, you know, I just couldn't get my bones in line to move properly so I could have the throwing motion so I could put anything on it. Then after 10, 15 minutes, the medicine, medication started kicking in and they would start getting some zip on it and start locating the football. And I was throwing at Mike McCarthy, a general manager. So I was thinking, man, I'm going I'm to dot him up, right? I'm going to pull him right through his hands. And, and uh, so that was the goal that night. And uh, see if I couldn't put a little X on McCarthy's forehead. Um, but uh, it, 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 it loosened up and got enough zip on it. And rest of the night wasn't so good for me. Um, it was painful. And, uh, and then the next day you're looking at the, you know, the Grey Cup and the crazy climate of Winnipeg that time of year. And, um, yeah, so for, I, mean, I, I look back on it. And you got a guy like Ricky Fogg, you know, like I said, in my opinion, the best backup quarterback in the history of the CFL can come off the bench and light it up with anybody. The best of them. You got him there. He's healthy. And uh, and you're pushing me out there with a broken collarbone on my throwing arm? I mean, who does that? You know, who who does that? And I don't know what Adam saw. You know, I know he believed in me. Uh, I just didn't realize how much. Uh, but he he will, he gave me that opportunity to do it again the next morning, day of the game. Zyla Kane, Mark Kane, syringe of each, syringe of freaking adrenaline before the game, um, another time, and then at halftime. And, uh, but Adam let me go do it. And I know that I wasn't striking a lot of confidence in my teammates during pregame warmups because balls were skipping much like the hotel room the night before, you know, and I'm not locating it, don't have a lot of zip, and then things kind of clicked in, right? And uh, and then I'm all right, all right, he's going to be okay. And I know that Adam's thinking, if Maddie can't go, Ricky's here, and we'll be fine. Well, I went, and, uh, you know, the rest is history, but I look back on it, and just it's a head scratcher. Because I was not spectacular. You know, I did not complete many balls. In fact, you go back and look at those stats. As the football team offensively, you're talking about a team that lit it up, you know. Um, I think we averaged over 38 points a game or something like that. We had nine first downs the entire football game, nine. And so, uh, again, what that reflects is the epitome of the football team. Uh, we got it done defensively, and Barry takes the first pass from Danny Barrett back for touchdown, picks it. Oh, oh, no, we got a we got a cushion, and uh, we're playing against you know the six pack, uh, Calgary Stampeders. You know they're lighting it up, and uh, they're a very powerful, potent offense, a good football team, and uh, we got a lot on our hands, but our defense shut them down. You know, uh, Gaines, you got to pick that game. Raga takes one back. I threw a couple of TDs. Um, uh, one I was I was throwing to uh, Paul Masati. David broke his route, and it looks like I'm thrown into double coverage, <coughs> and we have a mishap. We got two people in the same. Masati goes up, makes the circus catch. So that's one touchdown. The other touchdown was on a, a play action where I had to turn my back to the defense, and prior to that play being called and executed, Adam. You know, we call a timeout, and I'm on the sidelines. And I'm, you know, I'm not playing very well. You know, offensively, we're not clicking. You know, first downs are hard to come by. And uh, I told Adam, I said, uh, are you sure? I'm, he says, look, Maddie, he says, you don't want to run it, I'll put Ricky out there. Yeah. And um, I said, no, 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 uh, I got it, I got it. And uh, so go out there. And the reason I didn't want to run that play is because I was having a hard enough time dealing with my my physical condition at that point and the Calgary defense and doing what we wanted to do or capable of doing. I wasn't able to do it. So now he's got me turning my back in a play action to the defense and 
Adam said, Matt, run the damn play. It's going to work, you know? And so I thought, all right. So I boom, get the ball, snap, boom, play action, backs against the defense, turn, set up in the pocket, look the free safety off, and then DK is wide open down the rail. And all I got to do is feed him the ball. And I, and I feed him the football. It's a walk-in touchdown. And, you know, it's big momentum for us. And, of course, Adam's right, you know, and it's like you got to check yourself because it ain't about me. You know, it's about the team. Adam sees a bigger picture. You know, I'm thinking, I don't want to turn my back into that defense, man. I'm having a hard enough time facing them, let alone turn my back in a play action. And uh, we, we executed the play, and I can remember that. And um, and obviously the big touch to uh, kick off the turn from Ragged. Uh, it was uh, – and if you look at that play, you got guys like uh, uh, Dave Vandenberg, uh, Berg, Tweez, we called him. We got Andrew Murray. We got uh, Elizondo. Uh, no, excuse me. Um, uh, I'll get his name. J.P. Esquerra. J.P. was there. And then on the point of attack, if you look, what happens? And this is a guy, and this is Pinball Clemens, the other return guy back, Pinner. He comes and waylays the guy at the point of attack when Rogan cuts to the right and then just goes untouched in the end zone, right? And that's Pinner. So that is that is team, right? And we're talking about Pinball Clemens, the guy that freaking had uh, broke a record that year with all-purpose yards. and and set a load of country and was just at the beginning stages of this crazy, illustrious career. And throughout this whole interview, we we talked about him, you know, or DK or or David Williams and what they meant to the football team, how explosive they were. And Pinner was just another one of those guys. And in this play, he was, he was playing his role and uh, blocking for Raga and point of attack, got it. So, this football team with all the personalities, all the talent, the craziness of the decision for Adam to even allow me to go out there and play, you know, and for it all to come together and the defense stepping up with pick six and a couple of key sacks and fumble recoveries, interceptions, um, you know, we, we beat him 36-21, I think it was, and uh, and capped off a euphoric football season. That was uh, that was the best ride I've ever had in my life as far as the football team goes. and. Uh, it was uh, it was nice. Bow was tied on it that day in Winnipeg, in minus nineteen degree weather. That was pretty good, pretty good. Would you say that Adam Rita was one of the top three head coaches you had in your CFL career? Oh, no question, no question. I had I had some amazing men that I learned under. Uh, um, even though Pete Cantelo wasn't around long, you know, uh, I learned from him. Jackie Parker. Uh, uh, Larry Donovan, um, Larry, Larry was, you know, I learned things from Larry Donovan, but, you know, one Jackie Parker, uh, and then I had Don Matthews in 1990. I loved him. Um, Adam and I had already been together in BC and we lit it up there as he was my offensive coordinator. So I loved Adam Rita and I had Don Southern. I had Jack Pardee in Birmingham. Um, yeah, I had some legendary coaches you know that you could learn from and learn how to lead and and what it took to be a champion so you take those guys that i've had the chance to learn from and uh they're all special but adam adam was uh adam was as tough as nails Uh, he's an ex-offensive lineman that uh demanded excellence and preparation and effort and and yet he, he treated everybody uh as men and as individuals and let us play. And so no question, no question. These top three, um, it's, it's tough to rank them, you know, because I had so many great men to learn from, but, uh, um, I've that, that, that decision that he made to go with me on that day in 91, I just looked back and I shake my head and said, what was he thinking? Uh, he was thinking beyond my, aptitude my mental capabilities i just i just didn't want to let them down and did what i could like everybody else you know pinners playing with a 
with turf toe, you know, he can't walk, you know, we, uh, Chris Gaines told us uh, before the game, that this is his uh, last game as professional. He had a degenerative ankle and um, he was not going to be able to play anymore. If he would, we'd probably have to have some serious uh, work done on his, on his legs. So on his ankle. So he was, it was last one. Everybody was duct taped together by sacrificing like any, any football team that time of the year. I'm not saying, we were any different than anybody in the things we were dealing with because everybody is duct tape and digging deep to try to get her done and find a way to get to the finish line first. We were just able to do it. And um, when it comes together like that, the you know, head coach is going to get a lot of the credit for how he handles things. And uh, I believe Adam Reed deserves most of the credit because he had a group of players that well, we talk about it. So many, so many crazy dynamic personalities and so much talent. And to keep everybody happy and focused, uh, magnificent job of uh, of directing that ship. And now the relevance of the 91 Argos, when you look some 31 years later, still lives on to this day. It wasn't only a few short years after 91 that the CFL had experienced some financial hardship and expanded into the U.S., but it found a way back. And just like missing a season in 2020, the league continued to find a way and dig deep. And, and another part of what makes this team so relevant is when you think and reflect on the passing of two of the great men who were part of it, John Candy and Chris Schultz, and how important their personalities were to the team, to the organization, and just as ambassadors to the CFL. And like we were talking about before recording, that is what we we're trying to do. How can we create more relevance within Canada and within the city of Toronto here for the CFL today, because the stories that have been brought to life by teams like 1991, and then even later on 96, 97, those are the ones that we need to find ways to connect with the present so that we can bring the CFL more into the, into the spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mateusz, I think, I think, um, I think you're doing it. This is how, right. Young man like yourself from Winnipeg, uh, loves the game, is is enamored by the story of the Rocket and and the Argos in '91. Um, it's just continue to tell your story and uh, and get the stories out there and having and and people not being afraid to pick up the torch and run with it and say, hey, this is an amazing amazing league with incredible history and heritage and and uh, it. it it continues to uh, defy everything that's thrown in its path and overcome. And um, you're doing it, young man. Um, so hats off to you. That's how you get it done with passion, a belief, and um, a lot of prayers. Um, just because the game's provided so much to so many for so many decades. And um, so it's not that difficult. Uh, times change. The game really doesn't. The personalities are still there. You go from one team to the next across the CFL right now, 2022. And you go back to last year, you look at Hamilton's um, road, and you look at Winnipeg's road, and you look at what's happened in the colorful chapters of the CFL that have been written from just 2019 to no season in 2020 to how it played out in the truncated season in 2021. Um, there's all kinds of stories to be told and to latch on to and to embrace. And it just continues to roll, just like that train in 91. And nothing was stopping us. Nothing's going to stop the CFL. It's, it's, it's going to be there because of people's passion for it and like your passion for it. You just keep telling those stories and believing in the product. The product's there and the stories are there. We just, uh, we just need to keep telling. In today's day and age with social media and the different platforms and digital platforms like we're doing here today, just let's talk, let's talk about it. You know, let, let's get it out there. You know, let's embrace this. Um, so much comparison um, and so much uh, is said about our game and what it doesn't have. And um, well, what it doesn't have is, is a lot of money. It doesn't. Uh, but I think that's relevant and, uh, and only 
the numbers that you deal with across the country. Yeah, it's relative. 33 million people, 350 million people in the States, 33 million in Canada, nine teams as opposed to 30 plus. It's like, come on. Um, it's, but we're not them. We're, we're, we're us. And uh, you're talking about an American saying this, you know, I, born in Ohio, raised in Texas, went to school in Louisiana, lived in the South all these years, embraced the Canadian Football League since 83, lived there 20 plus years. And, um, this is it's, it's us against them, so to speak, you know. But I always think, and I always like to say, my good friend Glenn Suter, a guy I competed against 12 years, um, and a guy that's been a teammate of mine for the last 22, going on 23 with TSN, Suits and I see it the same way. We're cut from the same cloth. He was with those Saskatchewan football teams who are hard-nosed guys that just got it. They They hung out together. They knew what it took to be a team on and off the football field. And Suits sees it like I do. And we often talk about, you know, uh, can't we just embrace both? You know, um, they got they do what they do down there. You know, dink and dunk, four down football, you know, carry the linebacker with your tight end, you know, look off one of the free, uh, one of the safeties on cover two and we can make that throw down the middle. Yeah, that's what they do. We do it a lot different in Canada. And um, we got to make a boatload of throws. And uh, and it's a different game, different style. I love our nuances of the game. And, uh, you know, I, I love the 22nd clock. Uh, I, I, love, I love the three downs, the width. I like the hashes where they are right now. I don't want to move them and bring them close together. No, I don't want that. I want it the same because we are different. And we need to embrace our differences. Um, but we need to also accept our, our differences. And uh, in a world where everybody's trying to be more accepting, how about just accepting where the Canadian Football League and, and, and just keep telling our story and believing in it? And, uh, and I think that's how we do it. I, I'd like to, yeah, that's, that's my mindset. And uh, we'll be all right. I do like the gaming industry coming into play in the in Canada. April fourth, licenses are going to be handed out, and I think that is it's huge for us because Canadians are already <laughs> gambling over it's it's like twelve billion dollars a year illegally. So we're not asking them to do anything illegal. In fact, it's legalized. They passed the bill. They're going to hand out licenses April 4th. It's going to be legalized. Government is going to get theirs. And everybody else is going to continue to go out there and have an opportunity not only not to now bet on, on, on the Canadian Football League. And just not on the National Football League. I think this is going to help us. I think gaming is, is, is going to be a huge shot in the arm for, for, for Canadian Football League and for all sports and all Canadians because it's something they're doing already. And uh, I think uh, we'll see a shot in the arm there financially. And uh, I think that's a good thing. So there's there's a way that I think uh, moving forward, this is a good thing for the Canadian Football League. But just embrace our differences and accept our differences and continue to tell the stories like you. The final thing I wanted to ask you about today, Matt, is just some words on Chris Schultz as someone who is a quintessential part of the offensive line with the many other starters who had passed last year, who was a, a CFL and TSN panel member as well. What can you say? I mean, there's a lot of things I know you can say, I'm sure, but what would be some of the most important things you could say about what kind of person Chris was and how important he was for not only your team, but the league as a whole and yeah. being an ambassador for it? Well, uh, there's a lot of things I can't say and, um, uh, and a lot of things I'd like to say. Let me just go back. When, when Schultz was an Argonaut and we were teammates, uh, we called him Sybil, right? Because he had like nine different personalities. And and you never knew which one you were going to get. You're just hoping you're going to get a good one, right? Because he was scary, you know, at six foot eight you know, 310 pounds and cut like a defensive back, you know, it's like, oh my God, 
I mean, this guy's a beast. And uh, he, he, he and one of Schultz's favorite things to say was prior preparation prevents poor performance. Schultz, he was a workaholic. He was a master of his trade uh, as a football player, a technician, and, uh, and he was meticulous. And uh, for over a decade and a half, he and I were teammates uh, at TSN. And I saw the same thing that I saw with Chris as a football player as I did as an analyst on TSN. He was meticulous. He was prepared, passionate, and uh, and he was he 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 was reliable and accountable, and uh, that's all you can ask for. And he was he was an icon. He took his career. It was a great career in football, and then he elevated it with his personality and his the big man approach. Yeah, and and I think the biggest thing on Chris besides his hand was his heart, and uh, you know because he had mitts, you know he had big. I got big mitts, you know. And, and Schulte, when he shook your hand, he like shook your whole forearm. It's like Jesus Christ, what was that? You know, it's like I just been, just been like molested here. It's like his hand was just like dwarf your whole arm, and but bigger than his hands were his heart. And uh, I think Schultz, he, and I think people felt that, right? They, they, they felt that energy. And, uh, and Chris it gave everything he had, much like John Candy, you know, to, to the fan base and the people. And I think that was real. And I think that's what people took away from Chris was authenticity and his, and his heart and his passion. And, uh, Oftentimes I look at Chelsea on the show. It's like, what the hell is that? You know, it's like, what kind of crap just came out of your mouth? You know, it's like, what is that? You know, but that was Schultz, right? And uh, it was like, okay, I've never heard it said that way before. But, you know, I, I hear you. You don't have to kind of like work through the adjectives and whatnot. But, yeah, I get it. And um, you shake your head and go, that's why Schultz is Schultz, man. Um, one, you got the little sprinkling of, the, of, of Sybil and the nine different personalities coming out on national TV. Never know which one you're going to get. Never know how it's going to be verbalized. Or and and uh, he would he would spin it with his flair and created a, a an icon. And um, I was happy to be a part of it. Really was happy to be part of it, both as an Argonaut as a TSN member and. Um, you know, still haven't, uh, you'll never replace a guy like that. You know, um, if they could retire jerseys at TSN, his, his jersey would be in the rafters right now. So um, it's like that. Paul McLean and several other of our colleagues that we've lost over the years that um, he just he can't replace. But Tony Darchi is another one of our producers. Um, Paul McLean was a producer. Chris Schultz. These guys um, are just uh, iconic in our industry and teammates that can never be forgotten. And you know, it's stuff you don't hear about, right? And um, the stories behind the scenes and what we made that studio, you know, that studio that, you know, that you're in right now, supposedly in right now, you know, it's that we, we made that our locker room. And it was the best thing about our job was, one, we're talking football, two, we're in the locker room and we're just, and we're, and we're, we're having a good time. And we had some amazing times together. And, uh, God rest his soul. Matt, I want to thank you for having been on today's episode. It was a great pleasure for me to be able to get to know more about the 1991 Toronto Argonauts, what it meant to the CFL at the time, what it means today, and to hear more of the stories and the intricacies of everything that went into that magical carpet ride that ended with glory, capturing the great cup in Winnipeg. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.